Hi guys, welcome back to the channel, FPL Consult here and in today's video we have my Game Week 12 wildcard draft. The international break is drawing to a close, this is the last one until the new year. We won't have another international break until January and the game weeks are going to be coming thick and fast, so is the content as well. So I did take a bit of a break during this international break to kind of reset, unwind a little bit. I hope you guys had a good one as well and now the content is going to ramp up all the way up till uh, January next year so hope you guys are strapped in and ready for that if you do enjoy today's video please do drop a like please do subscribe to the channel as well and let's get on with the video so for this video a game week 12 wild card the team value that i've gone for is 101.8 million it's quite i think it's rather expensive and i only could just afford this draft so for those of you guys who aren't able to afford some players, you can always make some downgrades here and then I'll speak about it later on. The formation I've chosen to go with is still a 3-4-3 formation and it's mainly because I still do think like at this point of the season, defenders are really kind of being shortchanged here with the new bonus point system. We've had about 11 game weeks or so to kind of assess whether um, you know, defenders are worth value and a lot of the more expensive defenders, the premiums like, say for example, Gabriel, Saliba, uh, Trent for example, all these players haven't really delivered the type of points that we expect to get from these kind of premiums when we pay that money for them. So I don't think it's going to be a case where many people are going to load up with premium defenders moving forward. I do think that the strategy moving forward is going to be cheap defenders, all those around the kind of 4.5 range, maximum about 5, 5.1, 5.2. But aside from that, you really want to be spending all your money in midfield as well as uh, in the forward positions because those are the players with a new bonus point system that are racking up all the bonus points, right? So I do think like that is still a strategy moving forward. The first 11 game weeks has just shown us that the way we started the season with a 3-4-3 is likely the way that we want to stick with. So in today's draft, I really have gone with that kind of thinking as well, that I want to secure the best midfielders as well as the best attackers first before looking at the defensive options and choosing the best from the cheaper ranges. So... This video is literally going to start out in the way that I drafted this Game Week 12 wildcard, which is to just have a look first at the midfield. And the reason why I say the midfield, a bit of a spoiler, is that there's no Erling Haaland in this draft. I do think like with the fixtures moving forward for Man City, there's not going to be a lot of game weeks where you're going to be worried that you don't have Erling Haaland. In fact, I don't think a lot of game weeks moving forward that many people will captain him. That said, of course, he always has the potential to go nuclear in any game. And in the international breaks, he's also done really well for, for Norway. So I do think like in general, for game week 12, the value here is that you're reacting to recent news in that Haaland and Man City have not been playing very well. And it's not that I don't think they will turn a corner. And my own personal opinion is that I think sooner rather than later, Man City will turn their performance around. During the international break, players like Foden, De Bruyne all had good rests. So I do think like there's a good time for them to kick on and turn their season around. So I'm, I'm pretty alright if those of you guys who are keen on keeping Haaland, you want to keep him. But for me, the value of a Game Week 12 wildcard is really just loading the midfield with all the premiums. So that is essentially what I've done here. Salah, Palmer and Saka are pretty much the most expensive midfielders in the game right now, barring Son, of course. But I think Spurs fixtures moving forward, you don't really want to be targeting Son and also them managing his minutes. So Salah, Palmer and Saka here are just really kind of straightforward premium picks for me. And then there's Bruno Fernandes at 8.4 million. I guess you can call him bit of a semi-premium as well not super cheap rather expensive at 8.5 when you compare to the you know slightly cheaper midfielders like Semenyo for example but he's also not so expensive that I would call him a premium so he's a semi-premium and I look at these group of four midfielders and they really just help you to cover captaincy so well I'll flash a graphic on the screen right now and as I'm speaking about these players, you can really look at the fixtures that they have in comparison to someone like Erling Haaland and you just see the value of going for these four different kind of strong midfielders in that in every given game week, there's at least one of them that you will be happy to captain over Erling Haaland. And I think that is what is very important as well, that if you're not going for Erling Haaland, who is going to be someone that I guess people moving forward will still, don't, will still not mind captaining, then 
I do think that you need to be able to cover that bit of, uh, I guess, edge or that, that bit of effective ownership that you won't be able to cover with the fact that you have good fixtures for these kind of midfield players and you're able to just captain them with a better fixture. So I do think like Fernandez, Salah, Palmer and Saka are all able to help you cover those grounds in terms of captaincy. And in their own right as well, individually, they're very, very good assets to have. And I think we can all agree on that. So for Palmer and Saka, they're both yellow flags at the current moment. But I do think like this feels to me as a bit of a pre-international break kind of an injury, especially for Cole Palmer but he was pretty much fine. But he withdrew from the England squad. And then a couple of days ago, we also saw him in training. So I have no doubts whatsoever that he will be good to go from game week 12 onwards. He's had a good rest as well. And Chelsea are at the start of a tremendously good run of fixtures. Similar to Saka as well. Though I do think like the injury with Saka that forced him off the Chelsea game may be slightly more of a concern than Palmer's yellow flag. We'll wait to hear from Arteta, though I don't think that we would hear much from him. But hopefully we get some pictures from Saka in training, etc. But I do think like Saka would be fine. If I'm to make a guess, I do think like Saka would be fine moving forward. He's had two weeks of rest and he's generally those kind of players that are quite hardy. And the moment that he's, you know, hitting that minimum point where he's past fit, he's going to play and he's going to start. So I don't think I'm going to be too worried about Saka as well with a yellow flag here. I do think he'll start against Nottingham Forest. And that's why I've started him in this in this draft as well. So Palmer and Saka, both of them at the start of really good fixture runs. Salah as well here, Southampton away is a really good fixture for him. The next two are tricky, I have to admit. It's Man City and Newcastle. Those are not easy games. But I still do think like after that as well, the fixtures start to get pretty all right for him. And I think the only concern for me is just whether he's going to be able to keep up the amount of returns that he's getting at this point. He's he's had a really good season so far. In the first 11 game weeks, he's had seven double digit hauls. I don't foresee that that will continue. But for me, the reason why I still choose him ahead of Haaland is that he's that much cheaper, almost 3 million cheaper than Haaland, who's at 15.1 million. By the time you're watching this, maybe he drops in price. So I do think like I'll take the cost saving here, especially on a game week 12 wildcard and invest it elsewhere. And I do think there are forward options that are worth going for as well that are not as expensive as Haaland. So the real thinking behind Salah here is just go for him as a Haaland alternative, but someone who has decent enough fixtures moving forward in the longer term, and he could be your captain for game week 12, one of the best captains for this week as well. Now, the last player that I haven't spoken about in the starting 11 is Bruno Fernandes. If switch away is a great fixture for him. Everton in game week 13 is great as well, but then they run into a tricky run of three fixtures from game week 14 onwards. A block of three very tricky fixtures, I would say. But the thinking behind Fernandes, as always, is just he is the talisman for Manchester United. And I do think with the new system uh, of Amarim, my expectation is that Fernandes will be playing more advanced than you know the deeper line position that he was tasked with under the reign of Ten Hag. So I do think like with that proposition in mind, it improves Fernandez as a uh, FPL asset in terms of the positions he'll be taking up and the chances he will be getting. So I I don't mind holding Bruno Fernandez through the slightly trickier fixtures with the fact that he's nailed for 90 minutes and also on penalties and some someone is very integral to Manchester United. And if Emery is to come in and do something to change that um, you know, current situation that Manchester United are facing, I do think we could be at the forefront of a lot of points coming forward for Bruno Fernandes. So he's uh, in this squad here. I guess you can call it a bit of a gamble, but it's a calculated gamble here. And we'll see how he does through the slightly difficult fixtures. Aside from that, the last player on the bench is Antoine Semenyo, who was currently yellow flagged, nursing a bit of a patella tendon injury. But he did play 90 minutes in game week 11. And it did not seem to me as if it was something very serious. So based on what I'm reading on Twitter as well, is that that was a bit more of a caution or precautionary kind of rest that he was getting during the international break. He was, I guess, overworking that particular tendon or, or that injury that he was playing through. He pulled out. Now he's had two weeks of rest. And I do think moving forward, 
Bournemouth's fixtures are really good. He's someone that loves to take shots. He's always someone that is, you know, looking very lethal, especially when you look at the eye test. He's the one causing the most trouble for the opposition. So I like the fact that Bournemouth's, Bournemouth's fixtures moving forward are really good and he's just quite cheap at that price point as well. So a bit of an enabler, someone that I foresee moving forward would come into the team um, in a couple of game weeks, but you don't mind benching him with the slightly trickier fixtures as well. So Brighton at home here, he's on the bench because there are other better options in the four positions that I've considered for the starting 11. But if not, this is the midfield five. Let me know what you think about it and let's have a look at the forwards. So up front, it's Isak, Jao Pedro, and Yoan Visa. So for Isak and Jao Pedro, they are at the forefront of a really good run of fixtures moving forward for their teams. Similar to Palmer and Saka, Newcastle and uh, Brighton go on a really good run of fixtures, likely until you get your next wild card. So they are really kind of, I guess you can call them set and forget picks that you wouldn't mind just starting week in, week out. And it's slightly different for someone like Yoan Visa, where after the Everton game now in game week 12, as well as the less the game in game week 13 fixtures start to turn for Visa but that's the real kind of thinking behind this last I guess eighth attacker spot because I have some menu on the bench there who has really good fixtures moving forward as well I do want to go for a player that I don't mind benching in those t slightly tougher fixtures and Visa is just that kind of a player for me where I really want him for this Everton game in game week 12 especially for that Leicester fixture in game week 13 where I think Bre Brentford are likely going to score many goals against Leicester and I want to have a piece of that and if I don't have Mbumo in the team I think Visa is I guess the next best Brentford attacker as well and looking at recent form some would even argue that Visa is looking much better than Mbumo for these next two game weeks so I still want that Brentford attack in my team and that's why Visa is here. But moving forward, you could swap him out for someone like Cunha, for example, if you want to go for that. But the real thinking, I guess, is that Semenu has really good fixtures uh, for the future. And I don't mind starting Visa for game week 12 and 13. So once, I guess, uh, Semenu's fixtures turn, Visa drops down to the bench and then Semenu comes in. If you do go for someone like Cunha in this position right from the get-go, I do imagine that you will have a couple of benching headaches moving forward as well. So I guess a bit of psychological thinking with this Visa pick is that he's going to drop down to the bench from game week 14 onwards, and then we'll see what happens from there. Things can change very quickly, but at least I get these first two fixtures from him. And as for Isak and Jao Pedro... I'll be honest and I'll say that Isak is one of the first few names in the forward positions that I looked at because of how good the fixtures are for them and also how he is having personally a bit of a resurgence at the moment. Newcastle are starting to look very, very good of late. They win against Nottingham Forest, who are not a team that are pushovers by any means this season have really kind of made me think that Newcastle are turning a bit of a corner. And I think it's come at a really good time because of how good the fixtures are moving forward, starting with this West Ham at home fixture. Isak, I don't think, will run into much competition from Callum Wilson because he has been, I guess, in a run of fitness that has seen him go on, go on and play quite a number of games back-to-back -back already. And the thing with Isak, as always, is that because of his injury record and how you know poor it is in the past few seasons, they're always rather careful with him. So I won't say that every single game he's going to get 90 minutes, especially with the festive run of fixtures moving forward. But he's just one of those players that you know is going to start for sure. And I do think that he's going to get penalties every single game as well. So I just like the fact that, you know, with everything coming together from Newcastle, the fixtures moving forward, the form that they have at the moment, Isak's personal form as well. I do think like he's a player as one of the first few names that I included in the forward positions. Now for Jao Pedro, I think a lot of hype has been given to him. And I do think for good reason as well. Because Brighton's fixtures moving forward are really good. I won't say Bournemouth away specifically is a great fixture because Bournemouth are quite a difficult team to play at the Vitality Stadium. But specifically for Jao Pedro and in terms of his minutes moving forward, I'm not going to sit here and say that he's going to get 90 minutes every single game. In fact, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think what's more likely and, and the main reason why I have chosen him is that I think over a longer period of time, say from now until game week 21 or 22, I do think like he will outscore someone like Danny Welbeck. Because you could very well go for Danny Welbeck in this spot as well. Slightly more expensive. I think 0 0.5 million more expensive than Jao Pedro. But in the shorter term, Danny Welbeck's 
uh, minutes, I would say are more secure because of how he started the last few games and had a good number of 19-minute games under his belt already, as opposed to Jao Pedro, who is just coming back from injury. But I think once Jao Pedro starts to build up his fitness, and you see how integral he is to that team and how Hertzler just sings praises of him, I think in the longer term, Jao Pedro is the one that will be more secure for minutes. And also, you add the different different ways that he gets points. You add penalties to his locker as well. I think he's an asset that I prefer over Danny Welbeck for the longer term. And that is the kind of thinking that you would have when you're on a game week 12 wildcard. You won't think short term. So Jao Pedro is the one I prefer as opposed to Danny Welbeck. And then Johan Vessel, we've spoken about him as well. So these are the eight attackers that I've gone with here. With the thinking in mind that you'll be dropping Wissa down to the bench after the first two game weeks and then Semenyo comes in and we'll see what happens as well. Two things that I want to highlight before we move on. Firstly, Semenyo is on four yellow cards. So one more yellow card and he gets a suspension. So we'll, you have to monitor that situation. If, if it is a risk that you don't want to carry with your team, you could downgrade him to someone like Rogers. Now for Johan Wissa, the main player that I'm missing here that I, th- I see many other drafts having is Cunha. And I personally have Cunha in my own team as well. I think he's a very fine asset to just go for instead of Vissa. But I just think there's upside to have here with this Everton away fixture and Leicester away fixture. And you will have transfers moving forward to deal with that. The main thing for me is that Cunha... I think moving forward, he will still be a good asset, but the Wolves fixtures moving forward, there are quite a number of away games. The good home games have kind of passed as well. So I think the good thing about going for Vesa here is that you at least get to see a couple more games of Cunha as well as Wolves away from home. And if Cunha happens to be a really good asset moving forward, then Vesa to Cunha is very well a move that you could make two to three game weeks down the line as well. So there we go with these attackers. Let me know what you think of them. Let's have a look at the defenders. So finishing up this draft with the defenders as well as the goalkeepers, the five defenders that I've gone with in this draft are Gabriel, Lewis Hall, Anthony Robinson, and then on the bench, Levi Caldwell and Van Heck from Brighton. As for keepers, it's Raya and Fabianski. So I'll speak about the defenders first. Now, obviously, you have to choose five. And in terms of the fixtures moving forward, I still do back the Arsenal defence. So that's why Gabriel is here. He is, for me, the only premium that I'm willing to spend money on because of his attacking potential from set pieces and how majority of the Arsenal set pieces, whether it's corners or free kicks, are centred around getting the ball onto Gabriel's head. So I look at the fixtures moving forward as well. There are teams that struggle with defending set pieces, so I still think it's worth investing in Gabriel here. Aside from that, the rest of the defenders have gone really, really cheap. Lewis Hall at 4.4. He's a player that, as I've spoken about Newcastle's fixtures moving forward, they're really good, as well as at home against West Ham, who are just having a time of season that they're just not doing so well in terms of the attack. That I think getting a clean sheet for Lewis Hall is pretty much quite secure in this game, I would say. You never know what happens, but the fixtures are there for Lobis Hall, and he's so cheap that in the event that Newcastle go on a run where defensively they're not doing very well, you don't mind benching him as well. And you have really good options that I'll speak about. So Robinson here, Fulham's fixtures also are, I guess... It's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag with Robinson. It's For me, the attacking potential that he has helps to kind of negate the fact that the fixtures moving forward are a bit of a mixed bag. The thinking behind him is that you start him here against Wolves at home, but also there are rotations in mind with players like Colwell and Van Heck that you would drop Robinson down to the bench where he has slightly tougher fixtures and Colwell and Van Heck can very well come in. Now, Robinson is actually one of the defenders that are, I guess, more higher scoring because of his attacking potential. He's got a couple of assists this season already. And if you look at the total scores that all the defenders have accumulated over the first 11 game weeks, Robinson is up there in kind of the top few. So I still do think there is value in going for this cheap defender here, Robinson, at 4.7. Fulham defensively, especially at home, are quite formidable as well. So I don't mind having Robinson here. And then for Colwell and Van Heck, both of them have really good fixtures moving forward. It's similar to the thinking with um, you know, players like Palmer as well as uh, Jao Pedro. These kind of teams for Brighton as well as Chelsea, their fixtures are so good moving forward that maybe there is value in going for the defenders who don't really have much attacking potential 
but the chance of clean sheet is pretty good because of the fixtures. And that is where I think Colwell and Van Heck come in here. Their attacking potential are rock bottom. I would say it's really, really low. And if they do happen to get attacking returns, it will really be, I guess, a stroke of luck. The real thinking behind them is more for the clean sheet points. And I do, do think that looking at the Chelsea fixtures as well as the Brighton fixtures moving forward, that Cowell and Van Heck would very well get some clean sheets in the coming game weeks. So the thinking again behind these five defenders is to rotate them. I, I guess you can say four defenders because Gabriel is not a player I'll be rotating. So Hall, Robinson, Caldwell and Van Heck will all be rotated. And... I've looked at the fixtures moving forward and the rotations for them. It works very, very well to start two out of the four. So that's for the defenders. As for the goalkeepers, I've gone for Raya as well as Fleckner on the bench. The main thing behind Raya here is I want to double up on the Arsenal defense. I know a lot of people are tending away or I guess shifting away from double Arsenal defence. Some people even keen on dropping um, you know, Raya, for example, this week. But I don't think this is a week that you should be doing that because they are on the start of a very good fiction run coming up. And if you held him for so long in your own teams, if you're not on a wild card, you're watching this video, you're looking at me speak about Raya, I don't think you should be selling him because this is when he starts to get a good run of fixtures and it's essentially what you have held him so long for. So why not give him the next few game weeks, especially with the fixtures moving forward being so good for Arsenal? This is a game week, especially when you look at the clean sheet odds as well. Arsenal are pretty high up. And on top of that, for the next few game weeks, they are also one of the teams that have really high potential to keep more clean sheets in the next few game weeks. So I think this is a time where you can go different here as compared to what everyone else is doing and double up on Arsenal defence. And we know how good they are, so it sounds a bit crazy that we're, what we're saying right now, that double Arsenal defence could be a bit of a differential. So I think Raya here, as well as Gabriel, is really just covering the double Arsenal defence, and I do think there's gains to be made here. So again... With the defenders as well as goalkeepers covered, this is how the Game Week 12 wildcard draft looks like. Let me know what you uh, feel about this draft. Are there other players that I should be considering? I would think that Cunha is the main exclusion from this draft, but I really don't mind not having him here. Aside from that, I think we've hit majority of the players that you will want to include on your Game Week 12 wildcard. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. If not, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please do drop a like. Please do subscribe as well. And I'll see you tomorrow for the next video for Game Week 12. Bye-bye.